Hi, everybody. I'm Beth Holloway. I'm the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Engagement here in the College of Engineering. And I'm really excited about this seminar that we have today um, in celebration of our first generation college student week. Um, this is the second year that Purdue has participated in this national celebration. And um, this is the first research seminar that we've done about first generation college students. So I'm really excited that um, we are able to do this with you all today. And thanks for joining. I am going to turn things over to Professor Allison Godwin. Allison is an associate professor here in the School of Engineering Education. And she is going to do the honors of introducing our speaker today. Allison. Thank you, Beth. I am so delighted and pleased to get to introduce our speaker. It's a real honor. Um, Dina Verdeen is an assistant professor of engineering education system and design in the Polytechnic School of the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University. Um, her research focuses on broadening participation in engineering by focusing on the issues of access and persistence. She uses asset-based approaches to understand minoritized students' lived experiences, uh, particularly focused on first-generation college students, Latinx students, and women of color. Um, and she focuses on how these students author their identities as engineers and navigate through the current culture of engineering. I'm particularly pleased to uh, welcome her back because she received her PhD in engineering education and uh, her master's in industrial engineering here from Purdue University um, before she joined the faculty at ASU. And she's won uh, several awards already in her career, um, including the 2018 Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers uh, Frontiers in Education Conference Best Diversity Paper Award. And her dissertation uh, was selected as one of the top three in the 2018 American Educational Research Association Division um, D or the Measurement Division uh, Research Gala. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dina and, and turn it over to her. Cool. Thank you, Allison, I, I appreciate it. So Allison was my advisor, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much for all of your mentorship uh, that got me to this point, so thank you. Um, so I uh, don't need to introduce myself again. Um, I'm going to hop over to um, introducing uh, the, the collaborators to where this uh, particular uh, data set that I'm going to talk about comes from. So uh, the, the, um, the data set that I use is in this seminar is from um, Jessica Smith and Juan Lucena's um, eager grant from the National Science Foundation. So I, I did want to acknowledge that. And um, uh, so now let's hop to it. Okay, so students who are the first in their families to attend college enroll in engineering programs with accumulated engineering relevant bodies of knowledge from their experiences at home or through their communities or through manual or skilled labor. And so the knowledge and skill sets of first generation college students, you know, it may not be that of engineers or scientists, but of working class families. And so when these um, knowledge and skill sets are, are not valued in the engineering classroom, it requires that first generation college students negotiate who they are, where they come from, with um, who they aspire to be. And so historical research has shown that um, over the past century, engineering education uh, shifted away from uh, practical hands-on um, hands practice uh, in favor of a sequence of a science and math curricula. And so the practical education was uh, systematically pushed out of the four-year colleges or curricula and into the, the two-year community colleges um, as engineers um, sought to establish the field uh, befitting the middle class. And so the question about uh, what knowledge counts as engineering knowledge uh, is, an important, uh, is important for understanding and um, better supporting students who are the first in their families to attend college, who do come from these uh, working class uh, um, families or, or backgrounds. And so when, when the knowledge and skill sets of first-generation college students um, the knowledge and skill sets they bring with them uh, to engineering are, are recognized as sources of knowledge. They can serve as capital towards learning uh, engineering and ultimately contribute to their success. So in my, in my research, um, my, my work, I use a funds of knowledge framework to help engineering educators uh, support the crucial bodies of knowledge that uh, first generation college students hold. And the funds of knowledge framework can be understood as the, the bodies of knowledge, experiences, 
resources and skills that students accumulate um, in their household activities, uh, through their family interactions, or through the community interactions that they have. And so the Funds of Knowledge Framework, it rejects the notion that students' households can be reduced to being uh, considered economically poor or poor in terms of quality of experiences. And, in the, and so this framework has been mostly used in the K through 12 setting, but now a, a shift has been made to incorporate it into higher education. So in the higher education context, a Funds of Knowledge goes beyond uh, simply recognizing students' uh, household knowledge to acknowledging that their accumulated bodies of knowledge can serve as forms of social and cultural capital uh, to help them navigate through engineering uh, curriculum. And so my collaborators and I had a goal. And so our goal was to understand how, how well, our goal was to make first-generation college students funds of knowledge uh, visible and valued in the engineering classroom. Uh, as well, we wanted to understand how first-generation college students' funds of knowledge uh, supported their learning and engineering, supported their interest, and supported their persistence uh, to degree completion. And so we developed a survey skill that captured um, only aspects of students' funds of knowledge um, using ethnographic interview data of first-generation college students' lived experiences. Uh, we hypothesized uh, these uh, 10 uh, latent constructs that you see here. And so for the purpose of, of this seminar and um, the larger study that I'll be presenting, um, I'm only going to focus on uh, these four particular uh, funds of knowledge conscripts. So I'll be going over um, how, we, how they were developed off of the students' um, shared lived experiences. And so the, the, constructs, the funds of knowledge constructs that I'll be talking about are uh, tinkering knowledge from home, perspective taking, connecting experiences, and mediational skills. Um, as well, these, these four constructs um, will be presented in, in, the, in a bigger study um, pathway towards this seminar that uh, talks about uh, first-generation college students' persistence. So earlier I said that we used um, interview, uh, ethnographic interviews to um, understand students' uh, lived experiences and capture their funds of knowledge. And so um, I think our, uh, we, we used uh, the ethnographic interview data to understand how their, their experiences um, were sources of knowledge that supported their, their design process, that supported their problem solving skills, and that ultimately helped them navigate through their engineering program. And so a little bit about ethnographic interview techniques. So the researcher uh, is seeking to learn about the cultural ways of being of, of participants. And so participants are empowered to share their experiences. And in the interview process, uh, we communicate to the participants um, that, that we want to know what they know in, in the ways that they know it. And so each student that uh, we interviewed um, held various funds of knowledge that were obtained through their household experiences or through participating in the skilled labor force. And the students, and so the students that we interviewed um, demonstrated um, interpersonal skills as well. And such as perspective taking and mediational ability that I will be talking more about. And so uh, these, these were instrumental in their lives growing up and as they navigated the, their environment as adults. And so the six participants that were selected um, for the development of these funds of knowledge constructs um, offered additional forms of diversity, including an even representation of, of women and men, um, different geographical regions, including uh, rural versus urban, um, different uh, differences in parents' uh, occupation, um, as well as uh, their own educational trajectories. Um, some students were transfer students and, and some were not. And so for the purpose of this seminar, I'm going to be sharing the experiences of uh, specifically uh, Julie, Andres, Brian, um, and Brian uh, to illustrate how each of the funds of knowledge constructs were developed. So I'll be providing some vignettes of these students' experiences um, to uh, really unpack where these four uh, funds of knowledge constructs like, came from or how they were developed. Um, so after providing the vignettes, I will provide you with a definition of how we conceptualize the, the funds of knowledge construct and um, give you some example of survey items that, that were developed to coincide with these uh, latent constructs.
So here I'll be talking about how uh, we went about developing the construct uh, tinkering knowledge from home. So um, in Andres, uh, Julie and Brian's ethnographic interview, they, they spoke about how their parents like fixed things around the house. And um, through their work, their parents had accumulated bodies of knowledge that afforded them various uh, repair and, and building skills. And so Andres, a mechanical engineering student, spoke about how his family's business of, of recycling and upcycling unwanted item fostered an interest in inefficiency and waste. Um, so if you recall from the previous uh, slide, his parents would, um, they would go to either uh, garage sales or, or really just try to find areas where, where material was being recycled and, and basically upcycle it and, and, and sell it back to the community. So Andres talks about how, um, how his, uh, his family's background um, supported his, his interests, supported his, his, his uh, desire to start to upcycle himself. So he states, um, I want to build like a big shop to be able to collect all the material that comes out of these construction work and that goes into the dump and I want to recycle it. Uh, I can't let these things go to waste. I have to do something about it. Um, so this was in, in response to one of his experiences working at a construction site. He, he would see how um, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars would be spent uh, building a certain frame um, only to have it broken down because it didn't meet the, the design specifications. So he saw a lot of that uh, go to waste. In, um, in, and so his, his parents' background of, of doing this, like recycling, upcycling, really like triggered that, that interest. Um, and so as well, uh, Julie, a mechanical engineering student, recalls that her parents had this uh, fix it yourself type of attitude. And so she counted, um, she recounts several such jobs that her parents did around the house. And, and she explains um, uh, a lot of times it was something that could be, if it was something that could be fixed safely, um, we would fix it ourselves. So uh, she was saying that her, her parents and herself, they would do the fencing, do the landscaping and do the wiring and plumbing around their house. Um, so they had this fix it yourself type of attitude. As well, um, Brian, who is an electrical engineering student, uh, spoke about how at a young age, he learned how to fix things around the house um, and would spend time watching his father tinker. So his father works as an electrician and um, through his father's work, he learned how to handle wires, um, specifically uh, like recalling. So how to handle wires was more of watching, with, watching my dad work with wires, seeing techniques, how you clamp it on, twist it, move it, uh, pull it, strip it, and good techniques for doing that. Um, that definitely have not been taught. I think maybe one or two classes had, um, we had where we strip wires, but there wasn't much instruction given on how such techniques are done or good techniques. So this, this uh, he was able to leverage his, his father's um, experience and knowledge to uh, really understand how to handle these wires in his own um, class environment. And so the, the experiences of Andres, Julian, and Brian serve as vivid examples of how first generation college students' knowledge um, through their home experiences um, that are often not taught or recognized as formal engineering experience, uh, um, that are, they're often not taught in uh, recognized as, as formal engineering education settings. Um, so with, with these uh, examples in mind, uh, we created a construct called uh, tinkering knowledge from home to, to really try to capture um, this, this notion that students are um, learning a lot of like hands-on uh, practical activities or practical knowledge rather from their, from their households. So we defined tinkering knowledge from home as um, activities, knowledge, uh, such as repairing, assembling, or building that students uh, have engaged in, in their in their home environments. And so some example of survey items that we, we created for this specific construct are, uh, at home, I learned to use tools to build things. At home, I work with uh, machines and appliances. Uh, I learned to fix things around the house. At home, I learned to assemble and disassemble things. So there are also um, bodies of knowledge that are uh, less manual and more cognitive. And so the construct that, uh, that we developed called uh, perspective taking emerged from all of the students' narratives. Um, however, Julie's experience uh, 
experiences are emblemat emblematic of, of um, and I'm gonna share the, her experience only um, with you to, in today's seminar. So uh, Julie's experience as an as a engineering intern in a construction company allowed her to draw on her um, perspective taking funds of knowledge uh, during a project that involved waterproofing a foundation. So Judy, Julie recounts her um, experience uh, stating, uh, with waterproofing systems, uh, you can't just excavate straight down because it's unsafe for the, for the person standing at the bottom of the eight foot hole. Um, when I started looking at waterproofing, I was like, you know, we could do blindside waterproofing and put the waterproofing membrane down and then put the inside foam and pour the concrete, but it's unsafe. Um, so I needed to bring to my manager's attention that for the foundation design, we needed to actually have space for people to get in there and put the drainage pipes around the foundation. And so Julie, thinking through the design of the waterproofing system, uh, took the point of view of the technician who would be handling the, the physical labor of the project and advocated for a redesign that uh, took into consideration their safety. Uh, likewise, in her uh, senior design project, uh, Julie was tasked with uh, designing homes for families in a Native American reservation. And uh, Julie took, took on the perspective of the families that would be affected by her team's uh, design project and took the time to get to know the community and, and um, took the time to get to know the community that she was serving. And um, she recounts her experience uh, by uh, stating, um, I just kind of wanted to sit down with uh, tribal members. I think it's very beneficial if you want to like kind of build trust with people to sit down with them, to share a meal with them. Um, small things like that are important. Uh, you can't just blast people with their technical uh, details when you're doing something so sensitive as designing a home um, for people. You have to receive that feedback. You have to uh, develop that relationship of trust. Uh, you have to listen if you actually want the project to be successful. So through Julie's experiences and um, the shared experiences of, of the participants that we interviewed, uh, we developed a funds of knowledge construct called perspective taking. And so perspective taking is defined as the cognitive capacity to examine a situation or examine another person's experience. And so um, some of the survey items that we developed for this specific construct include, um, I am open to listen to uh, the point of view of others. I consider other people's points of view in discussion. I like to ask people questions about their experiences. I like to view both, both sides of an issue. So our interviews also revealed um, students' willingness and capability to help others navigate in navigate unfamiliar situations. Um, so for example, um, in one of Andres's jobs, he talked about having to uh, teach an apprentice how to drill an anchor in the concrete. And Andres rec recounts the experience by, by stating, um, he thought the tool was going to do everything. He set the tool and I told him, you have to be careful with the tool, it's powerful. And the tool spun around and it hit him in the face. And he tried again and the tool spun his whole body. And I told him, you know, we're about the same size, watch me do it. So I drilled, I, I drilled the thing. And I was like, you have to engage your body and you have to hold it like you mean it. Uh, so likewise, um, the willingness to, to be a mediator or to bring people together was also captured through Brian's description of his relationship with his coworkers. Um, as Brian uh, recounts. So coworkers uh, jump to conclusions on things very quickly. And I tried to kind of get into that conversation with them. Well, why do you think, why do you think it's that way? Um, why do you think that they might be saying that? Or, you know, do you know what they've done before? What leads you to think that uh, that's the best solution? And if we can better understand where they're coming from, maybe we can discuss. Maybe there's something about it that isn't the best. Maybe we're missing something. So through these shared experiences and, and through Brian and, and Andres's experiences and the experiences of all of our participants, we, we've developed this uh, uh, funds of knowledge construct called mediational skills. So um, we defined it as 
uh, students' ability to help others uh, sort things out in unfamiliar uh, situations or circumstances. And so example of survey items that we created for this uh, latent construct include um, help someone else adjust to an unfamiliar place, help someone else adjust to an unfamiliar like social situation, um, help, help different groups of people understand each other better. And so the last construct that I'll be talking about, um, and that's pertinent to the larger study I'll be presenting, is um, the construct, the funds of knowledge construct called uh, connecting experience, connecting experiences. So one of our goals was to understand if students explicitly leverage their accumulated bodies of knowledge in their engineering coursework, or recognize that their bodies of knowledge are scaffolds in engineering related coursework. And while our participants made the connection explicitly, um, it's possible that uh, other first-generation college students in engineering don't see or act upon the relevance themselves. And so we targeted two types of experiences. So experiences happening in the home or experiences that are, that are sort of hobby-like, um, which can occur both in and out of the home. And while we know that the experiences at home or through their various hobbies don't really capture like every micro experience students have had in their lives, um, we sought to obtain a general understanding of the connection between students' lived experiences and their current engineering coursework. So, um, so we hypothesized the construct um, connecting experiences to serve as a bridge towards um, capturing the, um, the transmission from funds of knowledge to forms of capital. And <clears throat> Oh, I need water. One second. And so we define this construct of connecting experiences as a student's ability to drop from hobbies or home activities uh, to scaffold what they're currently learning in engineering. And uh, two examples of, sur of survey items that we developed were I see connections between experiences at home and what I'm learning in my engineering coursework. I draw on my previous experiences at home when little instruction is given on how to solve an engineering task. So now that I showed you all how the, the four, how four specific funds of knowledge constructs were, were derived, um, I can now uh, show you how these funds of knowledge can help, can help us understand first-generation college students' persistence. So to answer um, this research question, we administered the Funds of Knowledge survey, um, survey instrument to 10 institutions of, across the United States. So the data for this study was um, collected in the fall of 2018 at uh, 10 four-year institutions across the, the United States, uh, West, South, and Mountain regions. And um, the institutions were chosen because they um, were chosen based on purposeful sampling. Uh, so five of the participating uh, institutions uh, were purposefully selected because they had support programs for engineering students who are the first in their families to attend college and or are um, considered low income. And that metric is based on um, receiving a, a Pell Grant. So of the 819 uh, participants that we collected, um, 46% identified as first-generation college students, so about 378. Of the 378 first-generation college students, um, you can see here that the, the largest majority, so 48%, identify as being part of the uh, Latinx community uh, as well. 40% uh, identify being, uh, being female and 60% uh, identify being male. 65% of our first-gen students identified as being, um, as receiving a Pell Grant. And well, 71% um, indica indicated that they were not transfer students. So uh, a different demographic. Uh, so when um, so the purpose of, of, of this study was to really recognize first generation college students knowledge and skill sets as capital towards learning engineering. Um, because when first generation college students knowledge and skill sets are, are recognized as legitimate sources of knowledge, uh, they can serve as as capital for learning and, and ultimately contribute to their persistence in engineering. Um, so the study so this study that i'll be presenting to you next um, um, incrementally examines how funds of knowledge supports um, identity development, as well how funds of knowledge 
and um, their developed engineering identity um, informs persistence. So to answer those research questions, I use the structural equation modeling technique. And so this, uh, this method models the relationship between observed uh, measures and, and latent measures, or latent constructs rather. So this method allowed me to um, model uh, multiple interrelated relationships. And so um, you can, uh, to orient you, uh, a latent construct was, for example, tinkering knowledge from home or perspective taking or mediational ability, and they would be represented as like ovals and observed measures would be uh, single indicators. Uh, for example, um, how we measure persistence was a student's response to a question, uh, I feel certain about graduating with an engineering degree. And so that's one single indicator. And so we, um, we modeled the relationship between these variables and um, the relationship is, is, is uh, depicted through this arrow. Uh, so because I had a rich sample of first generation college students, so about 378, um, I, I parsed out the sample to focus individually on women and then individually on men, uh, because I wanted to understand how funds of knowledge were supporting their identity development and were supporting their persistence um, based on gender. And so what, what I'm going to show you uh, first is the model of uh, women first generation college students. And so, so first, uh, I want to present a, like an, a well-known mediational model. Um, so this is well-known in the engineering education community. Um, a prior work and, um, and this current model shows that uh, students, when students see themselves as engineers, um, or students see themselves as engineers, when, they, when their confidence in their ability is supported, uh, supports both their interest and their uh, receiving external recognition. And so this is this is a, a mediational relationship that uh, that is well known in, in our field, um, but a notable distinction that I found with with my uh, sample of women first generation college students uh, that's that's different from from published work is that um, uh, continuously developing and sustaining interest in engineering was uh, almost two times more important for their self identification as engineers. And so for women first generation college students, um, only two of the funds of knowledge construct were uh, supportive of their engineering identity development. Um, so perspective taking uh, supported interest in engineering, as well as it supported their uh, performance confidence beliefs, which means that um, women's ability to leverage their experiences or see their experiences connected to engineering coursework uh, supports their, their their um, performance competence beliefs, as well as uh, bids for recognition. So that's this, uh, this recognition piece down here. And um, I want to add that uh, the capacity to, to take other people's situation or circumstance into account, so conceptualized here as uh, perspective taking, has been linked to um, innovative behavioral tendencies of like questioning, observing, and experimenting. And this is based on like published work in, in other fields. Um, and as well, the, the leadership and, ban and management scholarship has also confirmed uh, the importance of this particular funds of knowledge of perspective taking, uh, specifically um, individuals with this capacity, um, with the capacity to consider others' point of view is essential for effective leadership um, as it supports leaders when working with others and as well as a problem solving and, and being able to implement change. And I also want to, um, I also want to say that, that uh, to, well, to bring educators, to bring attention to, to educators that this fund of knowledge uh, not only supports identity development, but uh, it, it is also essential for, for uh, leadership roles that students take on either in their coursework or as future practicing engineers. So something to consider uh, leveraging in the classroom or continuing to strengthen and, and refine the classroom. So I did find a negative relationship um, between the construct uh, connecting experiences onto women's self-identification as, as engineers. Um, so recall that the construct of connecting experience is defined as students' ability to draw from hobbies or home activities uh, to scaffold what they're currently learning in engineering. And so why this is the case um, that the more women see connections between their hobbies and home activities, the less they see themselves as engineers, um, 
well, one possible rationale could be that uh, women could be receiving messages that the types of activities that that um, that the type of the types of activities that are legitimate engineering, like quote legitimate engineering activities, um, may not may may not be the activities that they're engaging in. So there's there could be a, a disconnect between what is being valued in our community versus um, what they're actually bringing in with them or or the experiences that they're having. And so while there is a negative uh, direct relationship between connecting experiences and women's um, identification as engineers, there is a positive um, indirect effect when considering um, this, this uh, factor right here of receiving external recognition, which means that um, uh, women's experiences, so this pathway here, down here and over here, which means that women's experiences um, need to be uh, basically legitimized by influential others um, in order to, to positively support their identification as engineers. And um, I think this is an, an unfortunate finding to, to be honest, <laughs> and, but it is a wake up call to change the messaging around what counts as, as legitimate engineering experiences or legitimate engineering knowledge. Oh, one second, please. Okay, so next I want to, um, I wanted to understand how uh, women first generation college students uh, developed an engineering identity um, and the development of an engineering identity supported persistence. And so uh, persistence beliefs in this study represents, is represented by a single indicator. And the, the single indicator was, um, I feel certain about graduating with an engineering degree. Uh, so if, if it wasn't clear already, this is cross-sectional data. So just collected at one point in time. So persistence, it's not measured longitudinally, rather it's measured as a student's you know, certainty to, to graduate. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll incrementally unpack, uh, one second, that's not supposed to be there. Did I go backwards? No. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll incrementally unpack uh, the construct that supported women's persistence. So um, develop a, a developed and sustained interest in engineering had the largest effect onto their, their onto women's persistence beliefs. So when you see here um, as well, uh, women's um, performance competence beliefs, so their ability to understand engineering coursework and their uh, confidence in, them, in themselves as of doing well in engineering um, also positively supported their certainty to graduate in engineering. Uh, however, most notably, I, I want to point out that um, interest in engineering was um, almost two times more influential in, in their persistence or their, their beliefs about uh, being certain to graduate in engineering. So I did find a negative relationship between women's um, funds of knowledge uh, construct of connecting experiences onto their uh, persistence beliefs. However, there is a positive uh, mediational relationship here. So if you see this pathway that's connecting, um, connecting experience onto performance competence beliefs, onto certainty to graduate. Um, so which means that women's ability to draw from their hobbies or home activities to scaffold what they're, what they're currently learning in engineering, um, when mediated with the well-established like confidence beliefs, uh, supports their certainty to graduate. Okay, so um, I've shown you the, the model of women, uh, first-generation college students, and now I'm going to answer basically the same research questions, but only using the sample of men, first-generation college students. Uh, so again, here is the known mediational model that we saw from the, the previous, uh, the sample of women. Um, as well as what's been published in, in, in the literature. And so now this sample of men, we can see that the, that the construct of uh, being externally recognized as an engineer is slightly more important for their self-identification as, as engineers. Um, so then I also want, I, I wanted to understand how the funds of knowledge uh, supported men's process of developing an engineering identity. And so what I found was that uh, four funds of knowledge um, constructs supported men's identity development process. 
So men's tinkering knowledge from home supported their interest in engineering. And recall that uh, tinkering knowledge from home was defined as activities and knowledge such as repairing, assembling, and building um, that students engaged in in their home environments. So the construct of connecting experience, uh, as well the construct of connecting experience and perspective taking uh, supported men's performance competence beliefs. So these two here. Um, so if you if you recall from the the model of women, these two constructs, per, uh, connecting experience and perspective taking, also supported uh, performance competence beliefs. And uh, lastly, the funds of knowledge construct of mediational skills uh, supported uh, men's bid for recognition. So. And so uh, mediational skill was conceptualized as a student's ability to help others sort things out in unfamiliar situations or, um, so, or uh, circumstances. And so in a way, this performative act is helping others such as like peers or professors uh, recognize first-generation college students um, as engineers. I, I wanted to point out that the funds of knowledge construct of connecting experience uh, negatively supported men's interest in engineering, um, which is honestly a bit strange to me, um, especially considering that um, there was a large correlation between the funds of knowledge construct of uh, tinkering knowledge from home and connecting experience. So these two are highly correlated, yet they have a different effect on two interests. Um, so there's a lot that could be teased out um, that my data can't help me tease out, but you know, future work can. Um, so how do, how do I explain this phenomenon to you all? Um, one possible rationale could be that uh, the notion of, of what counts as legitimate and valued engineering knowledge um, or experiences um, could, could play a factor. And so perhaps men are not seeing that their home or hobbies are legitimate sources of engineering knowledge to leverage. And so there, there, there is an area of opportunity that um, there is an area of opportunity for engineering educators to help bridge this divide, um, or or shift perhaps shift the messaging about what what knowledge is valuable engineering and um and in in how we teach our students. Um, but I did want to point out that there while there is a negative direct effect, there is a there is a, a positive indirect effect. So when when this connection happens. So students are using their knowledge and their knowledge is, is subsequently building confidence in their ability to perform, then it's also supporting their interest in engineering. And so while the, the funds of knowledge construct of uh, connecting experience um, negatively influenced men's uh, interest, uh, it, it positively influenced their self-identification as engineers. Uh, so at this point, I, I hope you recall the previous model, how there's a lot of complete polar opposite uh, results that I'm finding. Um, and the difference being that one sample is only women and the other sample is only men. Uh, so ultimately, I wanted to understand how men's first generation, for how men, uh, first generation college students, funds of knowledge and their developed engineering identity uh, supported uh, their certainty to graduate with an engineering degree. So um, I found that um, the a developed and a well-sustained interest in engineering was a four times more important for men's certainty to graduate with an engineering degree. Um, as you can see here, um, while being recognized as an engineer um, by others, uh, such as peers or, or professors, um, only had a smaller role in their in, in informing persistence. And so what, um, what surprises me here is uh, interest well, it doesn't surprise me, but what is um, perhaps a bit, uh, could be a bit alarming is that interest is four times more important for persistence. Yet this funds of knowledge construct here is negatively supporting interest. So you need to, for, for these groups of students, for this group of students, um, they need to have this build confidence or they need their their experiences to then subsequently support their confidence in, in doing well in engineering in order for interest to then continue continue to be developed so um, i think that there, there's a lot that could be done with um, this particular um, idea of students leveraging their experiences at home um, to, to scaffold their learning and 
um, perhaps it, it, it's up to us as, as educators to, to start to bridge that divide between the knowledge that comes from the household and the knowledge being taught in the, in the classroom setting. Um, so key takeaways that, that I want you all to get out of this. I, I know it was a long, it was a long uh, conversation, but uh, uh, what I want you to, to take out of this is that um, interest in engineering uh, is a powerful influencer um, towards informing first generation college students persistence. And um, this is true for both of our models of women and men. And so I think that the concept of interest is, is overlooked. But um, in, in my study, I found that uh, I found that uh, interest in engineering uh, was sustained through the funds of knowledge, through the fund of knowledge of uh, perspective taking that women brought in with them. Um, as well for men, interest was, was sustained, was fostered through their, their funds of knowledge of, of uh, tinkering knowledge from home. So that, that experience of, of having you know, repaired, built or assembled from home. But um, uh, interest uh, was contested um, so the, the, if you recall the construct of connecting experience uh, negatively informed uh, interest in engineering. So if, if interest is serving as such a powerful tool uh, to inform persistence, uh, we, I, I think we can do a lot more to continue to, to foster or nurture this interest in engineering and, and really start to bridge that divide between the, the knowledge that they bring with them in their households to the knowledge that is being taught in, in engineering classes. And so another key takeaway is that the funds of knowledge constructs of perspective taking and connecting experiences uh, support first generation college students confidence in their abilities to do well in their engineering coursework. And so perspective taking, um, if you recall, has been linked to uh, leadership and, and innovative uh, capabilities. Um, as well, in, in the classroom setting, we can support first generation college students by providing opportunities for them to um, connect and leverage their funds of knowledge to scaffold their learning and engineering. So first generation college students, um, funds of knowledge uh, uh, differentially informed their identity development and um, persistence um, in engineering. And, and this was based on their, their gender. So it's important to um, continuously examine the, the male dominated messages or ways of knowing that are um, continuously circulating in our fields. And um, so to conclude, um, efforts to, to diversify engineering education um, have remained, um, well, in, in large part have remained outside of the engineering curricula. And so efforts focused outside the curricula leave the actual content of engineering knowledge um, mostly unexplored or, or untouched as a site of analysis. And so my study um, emphasized the importance of leveraging students' funds of knowledge um, in order to solidify their, their confidence in being able to perform well in engineering, as, and which in turn solidifies their certainty to graduate. And so um, using the funds of knowledge framework, uh, we can, I can, this, this work can help educators um, acknowledge and build upon the crucial bodies of knowledge first generation college students hold and, and are bringing with them to the classroom setting. So providing opportunities for first gen students to view their knowledge as legitimate knowledge um, is, is, is an important like next step towards uh, equity and inclusion and ultimately um, contributing to, to persistence in engineering. Um, so with that, I, I would like to thank you all for uh, taking the time to listen to the seminar and um, just acknowledge my collaborators whom uh, wrote the grant where this data came from. And that's it, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. Um, I hope all of you out there are um, furiously typing as we speak right now your questions either into the Q&A or into the chat box. Um, feel free to use either of those and um, I will relay those to Dina and she can answer. Um, but until some of those start coming in, I have, um, I have a, a question to get us started. So your, um, the construct about, or the, the framework about funds of knowledge seems to me very, very related to an asset-based approach of thinking about diversity and inclusion in different um, minoritized and marginalized groups. 
Um, can you talk a little bit more about how we might continue to work on shifting our thinking from um, groups of students who maybe have more challenges or more barriers to overcome to thinking about those students as coming with some very unique strengths and assets that could make all of us in the profession better. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, this framework was essentially that a response to a deficit deficit theorizing of students who are minoritized, not only in engineering, because uh, this was developed completely outside of engineering, um, but it, it was essentially a response to um, how do we get uh, the educators that are educating these groups of students who um, are not part of this majority group to see that they that their households have all of these rich experiences um, that they bring with them to the to the household setting, and so that that concept in and of itself really speaks back to to the engineering field. Um, students, uh, especially first generation college students have a plethora of experiences, not only from um, their own households where they have to be more, um, more intentional about how they do work around their house or even um, having to enter the workforce earlier than others. Um, all of that is built experiences, build knowledge that could and, and should be leveraged and like celebrated in our coursework. Um, so what I, what I always find interesting is, and slightly disappointing to be quite honest, that uh, we, we always focus and, and praise uh, students that come in with these uh, robotic type of experiences. Um, well, to be honest, robotics are expensive. <laughs> They're expensive items to have and not all students grow up with these items. And so why not start to shift our conversation out of uh, cool, you did Lego robotics, or you, you had mind storms, or you, you had all of these gadgets that are not always available to all people. Um, why not shift it to, to a, different, uh, a different frame that really starts to include like everyday, everyday, everyday ways of knowing or everyday household items that we can start to incorporate as, as relevant, relevant knowledge that comes, uh, that, that our students are bringing in. Great, thank you. We have a couple questions. Um, what do you see as future work in this area? Yeah, what do I see as future work? I think the next step is, so I've, I've helped identify. So this, this model here is only of, of men um, and, and the other one for women. I, I've, I've helped identify that these funds of knowledge are important and, and how they're important is that they inform these various um, important constructs such as being um, confidence in their ability to do well, um, it supports their interests, and all of these constructs are also supporting their persistence. So now I've told the engineering education community, like, here are their funds of knowledge, and it's important in these ways. So how can we bring that to the classroom? Because that's where the engineering, you know, is happening. <laughs> it's happening in the classroom. So what are ways that we can, um, we can pull out students tinkering knowledge from home or pull out their perspective taking, their mediational abilities uh, with, with, with a lot of care and caution to not, um, to not privilege like elite type of knowledge. Like uh, for example, like I've just said, these, these uh, robotics uh, activities that most students in the majority group have experienced. Well, let's, let's stop focusing on those in the classroom and find other types of like household um, ways of, 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 you know, knowledge that we brought with, that students brought with them. And so incorporating that into, into the curriculum or into activities, um, perhaps as like reflective mechanisms, at least to get students like wheels churning and to, for them to even believe that like this val this knowledge is valued in engineering. So that's, um, I mean, that's a baby step, but, but it's, a, it's a next step that I think it's, is where we should head towards. Like how, how can we now start to use this in the classroom or, or allow students to the, the opportunity to see them and recognize them. And so not just these four that I have here, even more that, that I didn't capture in my, in my um, instruments. Um, so, and there, there are a number is just, uh, you know, I can only capture so much with the, with the participants that I have, but students are coming in with all sorts of funds of knowledge. So what are ways that we can use them in the classroom or like bring them out in, in the classroom setting? Yeah, that actually is um, another question that we got. What are some of those strategies? So thank you for um, starting 
to address that. Um, and I think it would be interesting to think about that not only in the classroom, but also maybe from an advising sense, from a mentoring sense. Do you have any thoughts about what strategies you might use with uh, first generation students in an advising or a mentoring mode that could bring those funds of knowledge to the forefront, you know, to support interest, identity, yeah, identity beliefs. That's a that's a good point. So I was I was completely just focused on the classroom, but you're right. There, there's also a lot of mentoring or ad advising that goes on with students. And I mean, I think the best way to be to find ways to represent and and like highlight these stories. So like the vignettes that I was sharing of students and how um, how how these constructs were born out of their lived experiences. Like how, like how can we start to plaster these on the walls or or create um, I don't know like some sort of like not promotional material but like celebratory material where students can see like you know here are here are other first gen students that had these lived experiences and 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 how these experiences supported their learning in the classroom. So like. I, I think that's a that's not something that I thought about. I, that's, I like that question. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, we have another question. Um, what is your perspective on whether different funds of knowledge like mediation skills, perspective taking, etc. are engaged differently depending on the type of coursework like a, a lecture based course versus a project course kind of a thing? So what's my perspective on how I think yeah. they're they're really conducive to like project based courses where you're really starting to work with your team and your um, like I said, the, the perspective taking uh, construct. Uh, I found a lot of literature in the leadership space that spoke about this very I, notion of, of perspective taking. And so leadership is incredibly important when you're leading a design team, when you're you know off into the engineering uh, profession, uh, being a, a project manager, like those skills that are incredibly important. So um, perhaps when um, in these sort of uh, project-based classes, I, I think there there is a great area of opportunity where you can ask probing questions to students uh, about in, in a way that gets them to, to start to reflect about their, you know, perspective taking tendencies or their ability to be mediators between um, whatever design challenge that they're working on, say they're, they are um, you know, mediators between uh, technicians and, and other practicing engineers or mediators between community members and the engineering um, design that, that will affect the community members. So really tr just set up a scenario that, that allows for these students to, to exercise this, these types of funds of knowledge. I hope that answers the question. I feel like I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it does. And I think um, maybe summarizing what you said is that students have maybe more of an opportunity to use their uh, funds of knowledge that they've generated um, in project-based, team-based courses, maybe a little bit less so in some of the lecture-based, um, lots of problem set kind of courses. Yeah, I, yeah. And so I do, I do think that even in the lecture-based courses where like it's just not conducive to a lot of like teamwork. Um, I think there is still opportunity for uh, for um, instructors to ask students to think about whatever they're learning. So like the, either some sort of a static or dynamic or even a circuits concept and, and think back to your household, like where did you see this come into play? And really it's 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 all about reflecting on, on how these connections, like how their household knowledge and experience is not separate from the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the the best way that I can think of at the moment is really to to uh, allow for these reflective activities, um, and so and and make that a part of a, a part of a grade. So don't just like you know on the side whenever you have time reflect on this. Like no, allow students to give them the the currency that uh, this re this reflection will will come of something um, uh, it valued in the classroom, and it will be valuable for them when they start to think about their households as as um as rich with, with knowledge. So I have another question and I'm not quite sure if this might fall under future work or work outside the short scope of this presentation. Um, 
So when you talked about your survey, you had a pretty significant um, number, about half who were first gen and half who were kind of not first gen. Yeah. Did you see, um, were you able to do any of your modeling for the not first gen group and look at what the differences might be? I, I do remember. So my the modeling work that I did, uh, it was it was more uh, smaller scale. So it was just regression. Whereas mm -hmm. this is like a bunch of nested regressions on top of each other, like, you know, linking to each other. And what I found was that the construct connecting experience was more salient for continuing generation college students. Mm -hmm. which, which means that they saw their knowledge connected to engineering. And that, that was, uh, that was kind of, um, I mean, I don't want to say unfortunate, but that's really what I want to say. <laughs> it was kind of sad to see that like, he, here are these groups of students that are, you know, part of the majority group and um, they already see their, their, fun, their, their knowledge connected and they leverage that knowledge, that household knowledge in the classroom. But our first gen students, um, there's there's a lot of like negative relationships happening that that I, I was showing you throughout the models yeah. that don't exist with the continuing gen students. So that was kind of like, oh. yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah. That, that, that comes back to us as uh, you know researchers, educators. Like, how can we flip that script? Like, like we know our continuing gen students are not uh, they're not struggling to see their knowledge connected, or they're not um, questioning whether it is or whether it's legitimate. So it's, it's our first gen students that are constantly like um, thinking like, is this even engineering or is this even relevant? And it probably is. It's just a matter of us sending them the right messages so that they can see that. Great. Okay, it looks like we are right at the top of the hour. Um, I want to say once more, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and or morning or noonish actually where you are. <laughs> it's not quite afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us today and presenting your work on first gen students. Um, I'm super excited to continue to follow your work over time as you build on this. And um, thanks to everyone out there who is listening. Um, hope you found this interesting and could pull out a few nuggets that might um, help you think about what you do both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And for the students that are um, part of this, I hope you remember to think about your funds of knowledge, the things that you know based on your background, and think of them as assets to what you bring to the field of engineering um, rather than challenges that you have to get past. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks, everyone. I um, hope you have a great rest of your day, and um, we will talk to you soon.